How many of you saw the sunrise this morning? Anybody see the sunrise? Not many. Oh, good. All right, we got two. Wasn't it glorious? Glorious sunrise. Paul, in the middle of his glorious apologetic and treatise on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, he describes the glorious nature of heavenly and earthly bodies. He says this in beginning in verse 40. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The glory of the heavenly is one kind. The glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun. And if you love sunrises and sunsets like I do, you know what that means a little bit. And perhaps you saw that glory this morning. And there's another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, because stars differ in glory. And I would say this morning we're going to celebrate the unique and wonderful glory of mothers. They have their own particular glory, their own particular calling. And so I've titled it The Glory of Mothers. Now, the reason the marquee says something different is because I gave Iva something different earlier in the week and then changed the title on her. The Glory of Mothers. I want to dig into the Word a little bit and discover what God had in mind with mothers. Mothers were created from the beginning with a glorious calling. It involves, I think, two great commissions. One is creative and the other is redemptive. Let's catch a glimpse of that background in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. In that passage, you will see pull that up, that God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Very first chapter of Genesis, very first part of creation, he creates a man and a woman. And he says he creates them in his image. Two lessons here. Women are made after God's image just as much as... As men, they're both made in the image of God. They both reflect His image. We often, we because of uh, uh, doctrinal uh, purity and accuracy in a, in a world that has gone awry, especially with feminism and trying to make goddesses uh, out of uh, women and, and trying to maybe reverse the roles that God has given, we refer to God as He, but He captures both the male and female aspects. Both male and female reflect His image. The woman is just as much in the image of God. But notice she's very different than the male. So what you have here is God reflecting a huge uh, spread of his image differently in two different people. He made them different. And they're very distinctive. One of the curses of our age is trying to erase that distinction. But they both reflect God. And in my opinion, if you ask yourself, well, what part of God's image does the woman reflect? Many things. In part, though, I think I would suggest the Holy Spirit, that she is a reflection of the work of the Holy Spirit in many ways. I am fascinated by this topic from the very second verse of Genesis right through the last chapter of Revelation. If you take that idea, you will be probably pretty astounded at what you discover. Take the first command here that we just read. Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish and subdue. Those words mean fill and conquer. Fill the earth. He gave you so much territory, and he told Adam and Eve, fill it. You know about how many people God wants to have, even after the flood and after the deserts have formed, because of the size of the earth and the resources it has. He promised Abraham in his seed, a star, many as the stars in heaven, as many as the sand on the seashore. So there's a, there's a promise, there's a blessing for multiplying. And after the flood, he told Noah the same thing. He told Adam, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Here is the house. Here's the land I have given you. Fill it, conquer it, subdue it, bring it under control. That was the command given to the first couple. It's a glorious vision. He is building a kingdom. From the beginning, he wanted a place. He wanted a people. You have to have a place to put them, and you have to have a people, and you have to have a prince, a ruler. 
if you're going to have a kingdom. He wanted a kingdom where he could dwell with who he called his people. And his people are the result of the seed of Adam and Eve. So you have the Spirit of God. very first thing him, he's doing is brooding over the face of the water like a hen over her eggs and bringing forth life. And then he tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And as you work your way through the Bible, especially in passages like John 3, 5, God, Jesus gives a, you a clue, you and I a clue, like he did with Nicodemus, perhaps, as to what that means, how that is reflective. Because he tells Nicodemus how to be born again, spiritually. And he tells Nicodemus there are two births, one physical with water through a mother and the other spiritual through the work of the Holy Spirit. For no man can come to the Father except the Spirit draw him. It's called being born again, the new birth. Paul says, if you haven't had this experience through the Spirit, you don't belong to him. So the woman gives birth, reflecting how the Holy Spirit gives birth in us. And throughout John, that, that is fleshed out in a variety of ways, the work of the Holy Spirit. In Genesis 2, when God creates Eve, he calls her a helper, a helper for Adam, one taken out of his side that's called alongside to help. When John tells his disciples about the Holy Spirit who's going to come abide with them, he calls him the helper or the comforter. Same type of Greek idea for the Hebrew word, called alongside to help. John 16, the helper, the comforter. What will that Holy Spirit do? What will he help us with? He will help us with bringing to remembrance what Jesus said, guiding us into all truth, training us. It's not just giving birth, not just nourishing us, not just comforting us, but training us. So if you are keeping up in your bulletin there, that's what the first three words are. A mother's glorious calling, reflective of the work of the Spirit, is to nourish us as a mother does her baby, giving birth to us, feeding us, taking care of us, helping us to grow, to comfort us, that's the sea, and to train us, to bring to remembrance the truth, the wisdom. But back to the first command. In Genesis 127, the ability to obey the last half of that commandment, the commission to replenish and subdue the earth is directly related to the obedience to the first half of the commandment. Be fruitful and multiply. That was part of the mother's key role, obviously. All of us got here that way. The earth's development, that is, whether or not it gets filled, whether or not it gets conquered, whether or not it is completely brought under the control of uh, God's kingdom, is directly related to whether or not Eve was going to have any children, and all of the generations after that, whether they were bearing children. The task of bearing children and raising them in the kingdom as lively stones in that kingdom, as the populace of that kingdom, is key to obeying God's command and to fulfilling His purpose. Now, to build a kingdom, you need to be fruitful so that you can multiply. It means more than just a replacement rate. Given our current cultural issues, the replacement rate on one resource that I checked recently, is considered to be 2.1 children per woman. The point one you may wonder about, but that takes into account a variety of factors that kill people off and, and uh, so forth. The source that I checked recently also says that the, currently our rate in the U.S. is 1.86. So we're not multiplying right now. We're not even replacing. And there is a problem with that. There's going to be, that's going to catch up with us, as we'll see in a moment. In fact, right, we've been below the replacement rate, according to this source, since 2007. A little bit of comparison, in 1909, there were 127 births per 100 women. And now there, are, in, in 2012, there are 63, and now there are quite a few less than that. To establish a kingdom, you need a place, a land, a promise, like God gave to Abraham, I'm giving you this land. You need a people to fill the land, also promised to Abraham through a covenant, I will make your seed as many as the stars in multitude, and you need someone to rule it, a prince, a place, a people, and a prince in order to have a kingdom. That was also promised through Abraham. Through you, I will bless the nations of the earth. Moses made that more specific. 
I will raise, God will raise up a prophet like unto me. And he made it more specific in the covenant with David. Someone's going to sit on your throne. That prince will sit on your throne. And all of those covenants are possible because of mothers. They're the ones who bring the kingdom in by participating with God in bearing children and raising them up to be members of that kingdom. That is why Satan is working so hard to destroy children because his ultimate goal is to destroy God's kingdom, to keep us from obeying the first command, to keep God's ultimate purposes from happening. So whether it's Pharaoh throwing the babies, firstborn men, uh, boys into the river, or whether it's Herod killing all the little children in Bethlehem, or whether it's the abortion issue of today, that's part of Satan's strategy to keep children from happening, to keep them from coming. Because you may ask, what is God waiting for in, in, in redeeming the earth? What is he waiting for in the restoration? Why does the kingdom take so long? The prophets throughout the Old Testament and all the way through the New Testament, you have this little two-word phrase that arises over and over again. God, how long? How long? How long? From the prophets who are wondering how long they're going to be in captivity to the martyrs in Revelation 6 where they say, how long until you avenge our blood on the earth? How long till justice comes? How long till the kingdom comes? The kingdom you promised Adam that you had to renew through Noah and then through Abraham and then through David, covenant after covenant after covenant. How long? When is it going to happen? Answer, when enough babies are born to fill the kingdom. He's building a kingdom. It a it, kingdom requires people. He has a place that he promised to give us the land that he promised Abraham was just a small representative, an allegory, if you will, of the earth. He wants to give us the earth. We inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. God's people inherit the earth. He has a place he's given us. He's waiting for the people. So when that last kingdom member is born, perhaps that's when. In fact, isn't it interesting in Peter when he talks about the final day, the final judgment, when God will judge the world and come and resolve all issues, he says this interesting phrase, and we can be a part of, quote, hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. As if we have a place somehow by God's call, by God's glorious commission to bring the kingdom in. And one of those factors are mothers. Because by giving birth, they are bringing us one step closer to the kingdom. One more lively stone as Peter says, in the building that he's making. Perhaps that gives us a little clue, a little light on that strange passage in 1 Timothy 2 where Paul says, Adam was first formed and then Eve. Adam was not deceived in the transgression, but the woman was deceived. Yet she shall be saved through childbearing. You know, the first time I read that as a kid, I was going, what on earth? Does that mean? Well, many theologians think that means that the very promise that he gave in Genesis 3 to Eve, to, or to, uh, about Eve, to the serpent, the prophecy he gave in Genesis 3.15 was, her seed will crush your head so that I can finish bringing in the kingdom. So it's a promise of the Messiah. How did the Messiah get here? Notice the Bible is filled with covenants and genealogies. He opens up a covenant with Adam. Then he has genealogy in chapter 5 through Noah. He makes a covenant with Noah. And then he has genealogy through Abraham. He makes a covenant with Abraham. And through a variety of passages, he gives you the genealogy to David. And then to David, he says, it's on your throne that the kingdom will come. How did these genealogies happen? How does your heritage happen? It's through mothers giving birth. It's a glorious calling to build the kingdom. The kingdom comes. His will is done in large part through us populating that kingdom, through mothers giving birth and raising children. So I know I've belabored this, but you can't get a higher or more glorious calling. It's just incredible. It's awesome when you realize I'm participating with God. He could have populated it like he did with Adam and Eve in the garden by just making them all individual. But he just made two couples, or <laughs> two, two people, one couple. And through that... And their obedience to that first command, he builds a kingdom. 
And through that, as the later covenants indicate, he restores the kingdom. He redeems the kingdom that got shuffled away in that first temptation between Eve and the serpent. She shall be saved through childbearing. The Messiah is coming. So the summary is, the mother has a glorious calling. The key element in conquering and redeeming the earth and filling it and subduing it is the mother's role. It's a grand assignment. It's a grand commission. They are called to bear and raise children as a covenant calling, both, like I said, with Adam, with Noah, with Abraham and David. The key element in all of that was, it's your seed, it's your children, and through your children that I will build, redeem, and restore my kingdom. Now, Matthew 1, verse 1 through 6, gives you a glimpse of the role of mothers in redemption. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, it says, this is the very first words of the New Testament. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah was the father of Perez by Tamar. First mother mentioned. Unusual to mention the wife, the mother in those relationships, in those ancient genealogies. And Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, the father of Amenadab, who was the father of Nashon, who was the father of Salmon. And Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, second mother mentioned. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, the third mother mentioned. Obed was the father of Jesse, Jesse was the father of David, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, who was Bathsheba. Four mothers in the first six verses showing us their glorious role in the lineage of the Messiah. It's a glorious calling. We are saved through the seed of woman. That's God's plan of redemption. My mom, when I was a teenager, before wrote a book of poems called The Story of Jesus in Poetry. And I want to read you this when it captures the theology I just described in much better, more beautiful language than I just did. So listen close for the theology here. Adam sinned in the garden, condemning his race to death. But God then planned a pardon from Adam and Eve to Seth, to Noah, on to Abraham, to David and Solomon. God predicted a Savior would come through the seed of woman. Atonement for sin became the price, and God had chosen between man's eternal death or a sacrifice in Genesis 3.15. Here God began the prophecy that he would send the word. Here he predicted with accuracy the virgin birth of our Lord. Thus began the scarlet thread from the Garden of Eden to Christ. For there in the animal blood was shed. An animal was sacrificed. When God himself made coats of skin for Adam and Eve to wear. Thus atonement did begin with God's compassionate care. Yes, God began the prophecy by his own promising word. And many lambs and offering would be before God's lamb, our Lord, would be the final sacrifice, making atonement complete. And God himself would pay the price for Satan's final defeat. Adam's sin had cost his right to be a son of God. But God displayed his wonderful might in the path our Savior has trod. As Jesus, God's only begotten son, a part of the Trinity, from heaven down to earth did come, to die for Adam, for you and me. The mother has a glorious calling. She has two great commissions. Her participation in childbearing is key to both creating and redeeming the world. She also has a glorious position. It is an honorable position. That's her post, her standing. Her standing is an honorable one, and therefore we should honor her. And this is an admonition to all of us who are children. How we should view and treat our mothers. We honor them. That's the key word. In fact, that's the first command when it comes to relationships. God, when he first opens his mouth, when the fiery pen or the finger of God, as Moses calls it on the Mount Sinai, first lights up, he has four commands relating to God. And then he starts on the commands relating to the rest of the world, the rest of the relationships. The very first one out of his mouth is honor your father and your mother. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 picks up on that and adds a little commentary. Paul's commentary is this. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, 
this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long on the land which the Lord gives you. I heard recently a sermon by Dennis Rainey, who is the president of Family Life Today, and he, it was a sermon on that verse of uh, honoring your father and mother. And he said, the promise of honoring your father and mother is so huge, you can't begin to describe what that means. All nations rise and fall on that promise. God gives what to Adam? The world. He gives the world. And he says, honoring your father and mother will cause you to live long on that land I gave you. He gives a land to Abraham, the land of Israel. When they forsake God's law, he takes the land away from them. I suggest to you that, among other things, one of the key elements in whether God takes the land he gave you away from you is whether you honor your parents. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may live on the land I gave you. If not, as one scripture says uh, in, in the curse to Israel, if you don't obey my commands, the land will vomit you out. Or it could be that he t has you completely taken over with a Nebuchadnezzar and grabs you and drags you out of the land if he doesn't kill you first. The things that we're experiencing in our nation today, I think, in part, are a direct result of not honoring our parents. God is, is working, giving you plenty of signs that the enemy is going to come in or the land through natural disasters or whatever else is going to be taken from you. You will lose your nation, you will lose your culture if you don't obey this first command. It's pretty key, pretty large. Dennis Rainey made a big deal out of it, and, the, and I found out later the tape was in the 80s when he made that. How on the earth would he uh, apply that now because of what's happened since the 80s? So the consequences of disobeying the honor your father and mother are pretty horrific in Scripture. You not only will lose the land if you forsake the Lord. By the way, Israel has learned that more than once. When they forsook the Messiah... He took it away in 70 A.D., and they didn't get it back till 1948. The Levitical law takes this commandment very seriously. In Exodus 21, 15 to 17, it says, Whoever strikes or curses his father or mother shall be put to death. In Proverbs 30, verse 17, it says, The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. The law of sowing and reaping gets kicked into gear with this command, perhaps more than just about any other when it comes to human relationships. Galatians 6, 7 through 9 says, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, he will reap. For the one who sows to his flesh will reap corruption, and the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary in doing good. Well, doing good involves obeying that first command, honoring your father and mother. And there are three rules of harvest, I remember a preacher saying when I was very young. Number one, you reap what you sow. The laws of the spiritual world are just as sure as the laws of nature. You reap what you sow. So if you have sown um, disobedience and rebellion, you're going to reap it. Secondly, you reap later than you sow. There's a lot of people who are disobedient to God's commands. Perhaps they're dishonoring their parents. They go, hey, so far so good. I, I didn't get any, no, no, no fire came out of heaven. No lightning bolt struck me. I'm going to be my own person. I'm going to be my own man. I don't have to respect and honor my parents. Nothing bad's happened to me yet because he's forgotten the second law. You reap later than you sow. You put a seed in the ground, it doesn't come up immediately. There's a little period of germination. And when it comes, it'll come quickly and severely. And I've lived long enough to see that happen. These slightest little disobedience here reaped a big consequence. Not fun. Often young people and teenagers can't see that, but I've seen it. You've seen it if you've lived long enough. You reap what you sow. And the third law is you reap more than you sow. The Bible says if you sow the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. So you blow a little a blasphemy or disobedience or disrespect into the air, and a tornado is going to come back or a hurricane. I promise you. You reap more than you sow. You plant the watermelon seed in the ground, and then you get all these watermelons coming out of a vine. And each one of those watermelons has hundreds of seeds in itself. 
which, it's, which can also multiply if they were all planted and became fruitful. You reap more than you sow. This is most true of honoring parents. But you not, only, not just honor them in the way that I've described here by obeying that first command. Paul says that honoring means obeying. So he begins that verse in Ephesians by saying, children, obey your parents. And he justifies that by quoting the Exodus 20 passage, which is um, honor your father and mother. But you not only honor them by respecting them, and not only honor them by obeying them, but by caring for them. In Mark 7, 9 through 12, the laws of God require that we care for our parents. Uh, and, in Ma- and in Mark 7, 9 through 12, uh, it's illustrated by Jesus describing to the Pharisees how they have not followed this rule. When their parents were getting old, the Pharisees knew they wouldn't get a whole lot of praise for taking care of their elderly parents. So what they decided to do was there was one of the subset laws that they had, their interpretation of Mosaic law that said, you know, if you dedicate something to God, you don't have to do these other things with it, like take care of your parents. So they would call it Korban. We dedicate it to God, and therefore they get praise for that. And they were all about receiving praise, receiving recognition. So they were dedicating the money to God, the goods, the services perhaps to God that they could have used to help their parents. And Jesus has a really strict rebuke for them. If anyone does not provide for his own, Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So caring for your parents is one of the ways you honor them. Now you may ask, well, what about abusive mothers? Uh, What do you do when there's a mother not doing her job at all, in fact, is turned evil and is working evil in your life? Well, the answer is you still respond the way God commands. You notice God's commands are individual. He commands a husband to love his wife, for instance, and a wife to respect her husband. What if she's not respecting him? He's still supposed to do his part. So you live because you work for God, doing your part, whether or not anybody else ever does theirs. The command to honor your mother and father is there no matter what kind of a mother or father you may have had. Recently, um, I saw a movie with my daughter Alyssa called Cinderella, the old fairy tale made in modern uh, uh, terms. And there was a lot of really cool life lessons in that. And I noticed that Cinderella, as portrayed in this film, did her best to respond to a horribly abusive stepmother in order to honor the instructions of her dying mother, of her dying real mother. And those instructions were, have courage and be kind. And no matter how abusive the stepmother got, as they portrayed it in this film, she was still remembering that admonition to be strong and kind, be courageous and kind. She would respond in in kindness all the way through the end. And of course, you know, as the fairy tale goes, fairy godmother comes and does all sorts of supernatural things. Well, in our life, he rewards us with supernatural things too, but it's God, not a fairy godmother. But the suffering of this present world is not worthy to be compared to the glory to follow. When we do our our role, our part, and we honor, no matter what the situation is, he will reward us beyond what we could ask or think. Jesus is an example of all three of these. He honored and obeyed his mother. Luke 2.51, when he was 12 and in the temple and describing what was to be the next 18 years of his life from the time he was 12, interestingly enough, turning to be a teenager, till the time he was 30, it says he went down with them to Nazareth after that incident of the temple and was submissive to them. And his mother, Mary, treasured up all these things in her heart. Now, if the Son of God, if God in the flesh perfect, without sin, can go and live through his teenage years, in adult years even, submissive to his mother and honor her in that way, we have no excuse. We have no excuse. In John 19, 25 through 27, Jesus is our example for caring for his mother. While in agony on the cross, we read this, quote, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother... And the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. 
And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. So while he was dying for the sins of the world being poured on him at that moment, he gave us an example to follow. He cared for his mother, that she have a place to abide. Last of all, the mother has a glorious task. It's an imperative task. It's her virtuous task. If we, as children, are to honor our mothers, what are mothers to do? So I'm going to direct the next few moments to the mother. And I would say there's three things based on three scriptural examples uh, that uh, I think are important for a mother to do. One is to pray. Pray. You may have to pray for children. The example we have is Hannah in 1 Samuel 1, 9 through 11, where she had to pray, having been barren for so long a time, even to have that first child. And when she prayed for him, she committed him to the Lord that there would no, be no razor to touch his head, the sign of the Nazarite. He'll be totally committed to you. And after she weaned him, she took him to the temple and left him there to grow up to be of service to God. And by doing that, she was replenishing the lost prophet. She was replenishing Eli. She was replenishing the role of leader of prophecy for her nation. She was being fruitful and multiply and replenishing, filling the role that Samuel was called to do. And she did that by prayer. Next, a mother should ponder. We read the passage in Luke 2, 48 through 52. Mary pondered these things in her heart. She treasured them up in her heart. She ponders what her children are doing. She's brooding over that like a, like a mother hen to protect, to plan, to promote. She's pondering. And I think the things that Mary pondered in raising Jesus all those years, you know, it uses that phrase of her pondering at the very beginning of his life, too, when he was born. All the things that were happening, the shepherds were coming, the wise men came, and it says she pondered then. And then here at age 12, she's pondering what's happening. I think all her ponderings perhaps ended up in this book. It's amazing the things that Luke knows and that Paul knows, perhaps, and, and others, that uh, you wonder, you know, Mary had a relationship with all those 12 disciples. And four of them wrote gospels, and, and a number of them wrote epistles. And I'm wondering, you know, when it gets into the details, like the details in Luke chapter 1 and 2, perhaps Mary's ponderings work their way into the word for us. You ponder what your children are doing. You don't look away. It happens too fast, as Nicole Norderman just sang. And last of all, you, to use a P word, propagate. You inculcate into that person, that child, what you've received. And this is what happens in 2 Timothy 1, 5, and 6. 2 Timothy 1, 5, and 6, Paul is talking to Timothy, and he says to him, uh, I am mindful of the faith of your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and that faith that has now found its way into your life. It is inculcated from generation to generation through the mothers. Paul is praising his mother and his grandmother for growing that faith into Timothy's life. So to summarize, let's capture our duty in one word. What's the one word? very first word out of God's mouth on the Mount Sinai when it came to human relationships was honor. You can go ahead and speak. Honor. Honor your mother. Why honor your mother? Because honoring her honors God. She reflects the work of the Holy Spirit. She's called to a high and glorious calling. And Jesus takes seriously the dishonoring of our parents. Notice that he also takes seriously the dishonoring of the Holy Spirit. Notice he says, all sin will be forgiven you except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Don't you dare do that. That's why Andy Stanley, I think, says he's got one rule in his home, honor your mother. We'll deal with everything else. He, he eventually added a couple of other rules because one of his kids said, shouldn't we hate the devil? He goes, okay, we'll add that one here. 
But anyway, honor your mother. God has appointed her a high and glorious calling, and you're going to reap what you sow if you dishonor her. So a couple of practical suggestions for honoring her. Be respectful. You can honor her by being respectful. You respect her office, her calling. She may not do everything right. In fact, I guarantee you that your mothers are probably imperfect, except for mine. But uh, it, does, it, it, it means you honor her like you would a judge. Several of my kids have been involved in Texas Youth and Government, and they try to emulate in their courtroom for those kids what real courtrooms are like. And one of the things that happens almost arduously uh, you know, and, and uncomfortably is when the person playing the judge comes in, it's all rise, and everybody has to rise, and then the, you have to wait for the judge to seat you. Why, why go through this formality? It's to honor that position. That judge, it is not to say that that judge is going to judge right on that case all the time or not have anything imperfect to say in his judgment, but it is to honor the position of authority. In the same way, you honor the office, and by honoring those in authority, you honor God. Second, be grateful. Be grateful for her sacrifices. Just having you and bearing you was a life-changing, taxing endeavor, and express that gratefulness to her often. Gratefulness, G.K. Chesterton says, is the mother of all virtues. Next, be obedient, as unto the Lord, as unto the Lord. She's under authority, so is your dad as well. And so if it violates what God has commanded, you'll have to respectfully decline from doing that. Next, be a blessing to her. In fact, Proverbs 31 says her children rise up and bless her. So talk to her, listen to her. Call her, write her, tell her you love her, be a blessing to her, be there for her. That's one of the ways you can rise up and be a blessing and not a curse. And then be a caregiver. Care for her. Start now as a, as a young child or as a teenager. Don't wait until you're older to care for your mom. Do an extra chore now. Bear a burden now. Help her with the load now without being asked. Next, be forgiving. Be patient. Even though she has a high calling, she's imperfect. So you will have to be kind, patient, and forgiving. And Jesus is your example of that. And then last of all, be her prayer warrior. Pray for her. These are ways you can honor your mother. Respect her. Be grateful to her. Be obedient to her. Be a blessing to her. Care for her. Be forgiving. And be constantly in prayer for her. Let's pray. Let's pray.